lecture on tefillah. I'm leaving a lecture tonight on prayer. And there are many ways to approach this topic. This topic is a, a vast topic and such an important topic. And I'm going to give you my take a little bit. It's not the only take, and there's so much we can talk about when it comes to prayer. But I'd like to talk a little bit about it tonight. And even if we just touch the surface, I think that uh, it will be beneficial. First of all, just a few questions. I remember once I was giving a class, and I had a student. And this, this is a gentleman. He's about 70 now. He comes to my classes, somebody I've been close with for years, and he asked me a question. He was, he's actually an artist. He's a, he's a modern artist. He asked me a question. He said, Rabbi, because I've always wanted to ask this. I always see you, you know, people who know what they're doing, Orthodox Jews maybe, right? We. You're always standing there davening like this, you know? He goes, let me ask you a question. He goes, what are you doing? What's happening? Like, what, can you define it for me? And I said to him, you know, finally somebody had the guts to ask. And I said to the class, was anybody else wondering what we're doing when we go like this? You know, and, and the man was like, yeah, what exactly is happening? Like, what, what's he supposed to be doing? Like, what are you, what's going on in prayer? Is there something that's supposed to be happening? Like rappers do, they do the same thing. The rappers do the same thing. <laughs> that's a good point. I remember once I was, a person told me, he said to me, he came up to me, we had a neighbor, not Jewish, and he came up to me and said to me, Rabbi, I now know why Jews, when they dive in, they go like this. And I said, why? And he told me, he said, I was watching Channel 13 last night, and he said that because the Jews were always moving from place to place, you know, where the, you know, where the, where the wandering Jews. And when we would travel, we would travel on camels, and so we would have to pray while on the camels, so we'd look like this, you know, we'd have to go up and down, up and down, and so we got in the habit of going up and down, I said, that's what they said on Channel 13? That's what they said. So it gave me an awesome realization that there's a lot of misinformation out there in the world. So there's a lot of clarity that, that needs to happen. Let's see if we can give some clarity on what's happening during prayer. So first of all, you know, sometimes you are up there and you have your seat door open, you know, and, and you're praying, right? You, 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 and what are you doing? What are we doing? What are we supposed to be doing? And sometimes if you stop yourself, you kind of ask yourself that question. Like, am I talking to somebody? You know, am I talking to God? Like, what, what, am I, what am I doing? What's supposed to be going through my mind? What am I supposed to be feeling or experiencing? So let's see if we can grip it a little bit. You know, first of all, There's a problem that many people suffer from. You know, some people in the world have, um, I know, all sorts of diseases, all sorts of chemical imbalances or psychological disability, whatever it might be. There's a type of syndrome that some people might have in the world, something we might call 2DS. 2DS means two-dimensional syndrome. Two-dimensional syndrome. Two-dimensional syndrome means you look at the world in two dimensions. What I see is all that there is. What I can see with my physical eye is what reality is. That's called 2DS, two-dimensional syndrome. And it's a sickness because there's a reality going behind the scenes which we can't see. And that reality is what we call God. And of course, today we have so many metaphors for this in the world. You know, there's so many radio waves that are shooting around all over us right now. And I'm sure scientists and guys who study science or girls who study science can tell us all about it. But we can't see it. But it's there. But of course, it's another dimension. The world of God is the realization that there's a third dimension going on. There's a world that we have to train ourselves to plug into. You know, I'll tell you the most beautiful story that I heard that totally changed my life in some ways. I've been recommending this book all year to many of my girl students. There's a book called The Holy Woman by Sarah Rigler. Have you seen that in the stories? 
I recommend this book so highly. It's about a woman. Her name is Sarah Chaya Sarah Kramer. And she grew up in Eastern Europe. She went through the war. And she was in Auschwitz, concentration camp, 16. In fact, she was experimented on by Mengele, Yimach Shemo Zichr. Mengele was the doctor in, in Auschwitz. She was able to survive Auschwitz. Her whole family was killed. She comes to Eretz Yisrael, remarries to a wonderful person who actually was a, became known in Israel as a great tzaddik, a person people would go to for blessings in their life. And I went to him for a blessing in my own life, going back about 24 years ago. And he gave me a certain blessing, and it, it came true. A very, very holy person. At the time, I didn't even know who he was. They lived in a dirt floor house way up in um, the northern part of Israel. But I didn't appreciate who I went to until his book came out. Then I realized that was the person. So I met them. I didn't know who I was meeting at the time. I thought they were two simple farmers. <laughs> Turns out they were two of the holiest people in Israel. And a certain woman who wrote the book came very close to this woman later in her life. She moved from there to Jerusalem at the end of her life. And she got to know her. And this woman, actually, who wrote the book, she defines, she tells about herself, that before she became a traditional Jew, an Orthodox Jew, she spent over 12 years in an ashram. You know what an ashram is? An ashram is in a Hindu house of worship. She studied Eastern religion and spent 12 years studying in an ashram. And I ask you imagine that, a Jewish girl in an ashram for 12 years. She met a rabbi, I'm not sure if it was in India or someplace else, but the rabbi encouraged her to come to Jerusalem. She came to Jerusalem. She ended up meeting certain people, started studying and learning in different seminaries for girls. Now, Baruch Hashem, she's a very, very orthodox religious woman, lives in Jerusalem, writes beautiful, beautiful books. So she was having a discussion with this woman, Chayasar Kramer. And she was telling Chayasar Kramer, listen, you know, I've always wanted to ask this question. Tell me, please, what was it like in Auschwitz? Concentration camp, right? We know what Auschwitz is. What was it like in Auschwitz? We've all had that question, right? What was it like? So, Chayesar Kramer answers her and says to her, I have to tell you something. You were in an, an Indian ashram for 12 years. That was a bad place. Auschwitz, it wasn't so bad. She looks at her, what do you mean? Auschwitz wasn't so bad? How could that it wasn't so bad? It was a place of starvation, a place of death. It was a death camp, a crematoria, gas chambers. What do you mean Auschwitz wasn't so bad? I, you know, she said, listen, you know, when you were in this ashram in India, for 12 years you were meditating, you were focused totally on yourself. When you're existing only for yourself, that's a bad place to be. We were in Auschwitz. But I went with a group of girls that I knew from Czechoslovakia. We were on the train together. We stayed together. We did kindness for each other whenever we could. We helped each other. We gave each other our bread if they needed it, if the other one needed it more. We shared whatever we could share. If we had time to daven, we davened. If we could do a mitzvah, we did a mitzvah. There was, we, so she said, when I was on the train going to Auschwitz, we knew this was the end. She said, I memorized the Rosh Hashanah davening. In case someone would need to know it, I would have it in my head. She said, another girl memorized Megillat Esther so that she could read the Megillat Esther for there on Purim. We lived for God and for others. When you're living for God and for others, it doesn't matter where you are, it's a good place. Where you are in India, that was a bad place. I'll tell you, I read those words. I had to stop and think about it for, for a half an hour. Unbelievable words. Good means when you're connected with God. That is good. When you're just connected with yourself, that's two-dimensional. You're missing the third dimension. You could be in Auschwitz, but you understand that the person next to me has created the image of God, and I'm going to do kindness for her or him. I'm in Auschwitz, but I'm going to have an opportunity to connect to my creator. That's a good place. You're, where a, you're in an ashram, and it's only about you and you and you and you and you. That's a bad place. That's two-dimensional. 
If you're close to God in a three-dimensional way, you have a relationship with God, that is a good place. She said, compared to the Ad Ashram, Auschwitz was a good place. Those words totally changed my life. Because it totally redefined for me what life is about. Life is about gaining that three dimensional relationship, looking behind the surface and discovering a relationship with God. I'll just say one, one other story that, that, that blew me away. There was this a certain girl came to Jerusalem and she ended up at the yeshiva there called Neve, Neve Yerushalayim. You know Neve? Neve Yerushalayim is the seminary for girls in Jerusalem. She came in, she wasn't married, but she happened to be pregnant. So she went to speak to one of the rabbis there and she said to the rabbi, she said, listen, you know, I've decided that I'm going to have an abortion. And the rabbi said, an abortion? He said, um, you know, in, in Jewish law, it's not allowed. She said, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not having this child, I'm having an abortion. So he said, listen, I can't stop you from doing what you want to do, but it is an operation, it is a procedure, it's a medical procedure. And before we do anything medically, we try to get at least a blessing from a great person. Why don't you come with me and we'll get a blessing from a very big rabbi. So she agreed. And they went to speak to Rav Shlomo Zalman Arubach. At that time, this is going back about, about I don't know, 15 years ago. 12 years ago, maybe. Rav Shlomo Zalman he died about, 10, about, about 12 years ago. Rav Shlomo Zalman Arubach was at that time maybe the biggest person in Israel. As you can think about what big means. I mean, a great, great rabbi, a giant of a human being. When he died, you know how many people came to his funeral? Have you been to big funerals before? You know, you've been to a big funeral. A big funeral in America might be, I don't know, 100 people, 200 people, 1,000 people. At Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach's funeral, 300,000 people. And in a population in Israel of 4 million. That's about 8% of Israel was at his funeral. Can we this is the type of person he was. A huge giant of a human being. He would see people at his home in Shari Chesed, which is a neighbor in Jerusalem, between 12 and 2 in the morning. He had to get there, he had to get in line at midnight, and he would give blessings and speak to you between 12 and 2. So he had to be there at midnight. So they went, got there at midnight, got in line. They went in to speak to him. Finally, it was their turn. He sits down with this girl. And he says to her, what, you know, what, what can I do for you? And she says that, you know, I want to have an abortion. So he looks at her and he said, you know, what do you do? She said, uh, I'm studying to be a doctor. I said, why are you studying to be a doctor? She said, because I want to save life. And so he said, so new? Yeah. She said, it's not life. Who says it's life? Life is when it comes out. Who says life on the inside? We hold it is life. But who says it's life on the inside? Not life. So he didn't argue. He always said to her with the following words. He said to her, listen, the way I see it is you have two choices. He says, you can have the baby, and I'll take the baby. And I'll raise the baby as my child. And he looked at her, and, and he, you know, she didn't know him. She said, look, you know, I, he was an old man. He said, I've been very successful. I have very nice children. I raised them very nicely. People know me in the neighborhood. My name is Arabach. Ask anybody. They know me, you know. You know, 300,000 people come to his funeral, believe people know him. You know, it's, he said, it's, you know, people know me, the name is Arabach, ask anybody, yeah, they, they know me, you can trust me. He said, I'll take the child and I'll raise the child as my child. So she looks at him and she said, what's my second choice? Second choice is you have the child and you raise the child. And that's what she did. And not only did she do that, she ended up becoming a religious woman. What changed in her heart? In her mind, the baby on the inside is only a baby. There's no soul. When she saw that somebody lived in three dimensions, he sees a human being, and he says a human being has something so deep that you can't kill that. I'll take the child of my own child. You want to destroy this child because you don't want the convenience, inconvenience? I'll take the child because I want it. 
I know there's something that you can't see. It totally turns her head around. There's a part to a human being that I'm missing that is worth this person taking my child. What am I not seeing? There's another dimension to the human being. That's the soul. Life is all about getting in touch with that third dimension. Getting in touch with our souls and getting in touch with God. And that's what we're trying to do. So step number one in prayer is we have to realize that there is another dimension called God. And we have to start relating to it and we're getting to know Him. So this is how it begins. It really begins like this. Prayer begins like this. I stand before God. I have to start focusing a little bit. I have to start thinking. You know, and if you really start thinking, sometimes you feel a little bit uncomfortable even. You know, you take, you know, first of all, the halacha says you're supposed to start physically preparing yourself for this encounter with God. You know, and how do we do that physically? Just like you would do it with another person. You know, if you're going in for a business meeting or an interview at a job company, right? It's like that, an interview for a graduate program. What do you do? Well, first thing you do is you check to make sure your tie is straight, right? You want to make sure that nothing is dangling from your pockets, right? Everything is, is nice looking and neat looking. You know, your cuffs are sticking out a little bit, right? You know, you get ready. Physically prepare yourself to be aware of the reality that I'm now standing before God. And then what do you do? We know we take three steps back with our left foot, three steps forward with our right foot. Why the right? Because the right is always the side of, of strength. And we want to show an eagerness, a desire to go forward. And we stand with our feet together, our hands in front of us like somebody who's going to ask something. When you ask a request, you do it in a very humble way. Before God, we want to get our body positioned correctly in order to visualize the experience. And then you know what happens at this point? You kind of, in your head, all of a sudden you start thinking, what am I doing? You know, like, you know, like, what am I supposed to be, like, what am I supposed to be visualizing? You know, I'm supposed to be, what am I supposed to be thinking about? You know, you always feel a little uncomfortable. You know, at first you're like, you know, you know, like you look around, everybody else is doing it, but if you're really focusing in, you're thinking like, you know, I know you're there, God, but like, I, I can't see you exactly. Now it's interesting, our sages tell us it's for this reason that God created imagination. You've probably noticed that you have very, very good imaginations. Have you found that in life? That you can imagine all sorts of bizarre, crazy things? Or you can imagine all sorts of things that you might even want to imagine? We have something very, very powerful in the human mind called imagination. Why do you think God gave us imagination? For an abstract. He gave us this abstract ability so we should get to know Him. We have imagination in order that we should be able to picture something which is abstract, but it's there. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to start in our minds actually conjuring that I'm before God. Now what does God look like? I can't tell you. We're not allowed to tell you. We're not allowed to give Him an image. But we can use our powerful brains and our imaginations to actually visualize that we are before God in some way. Now what that looks like, I can't define it for you. In my own mind, I can't define it for you. All I know is that I'm before you, God. And I can't, there's no picture. But it's, it's, it's a reality that I feel and experience in my mind. That's called imagination. And that's the power of the brain. The brain is very, very powerful, very able to, to create this abstract reality. And then what do you do? supposed to talk to God like you talk to a friend. So what does that mean? It means that if you're really davening well, if you're really praying well, you know, I know I've never seen any two friends talk to each other like this, you know. You know? I mean, unless they don't like each other very much. But when you really like somebody, what do you do? You know? I mean, the hands start talking. You know, I talk with my hands. Right? You probably noticed that. Someone said to me, Rabbi Kraft, if someone cut your hands off, you'd be mute. You know? <laughs> but if you really are into an idea, the hands start talking with you. When you really talk to God, your hands talk with you a little bit. They're talking. It's a dialogue. Speak like you speak to a friend. Talking to a friend. Now, you probably noticed in prayer 
that we whisper. What's that all about? It was very interesting. The Muslims, when they pray, what do they do? Scream. They scream. <laughs> the Christians, when they pray, what do they do? <laughs> well, they're totally silent. Quiet. Quiet. Yeah. <laughs> totally silent. When we Jews pray, what do we do? We whisper. What's the whispering all about? What's whispering all about? Well, whispering is all about, when do we whisper in life? When they have a secret. Yeah, when you want to communicate with somebody that you're really close with, you whisper. Right? You whisper. If you're very close to somebody, you talk softly and you whisper. That's the reality. If you're on a nice date with a person you hope will be your wife or your husband, you're not going to be sitting across the table at each other. Oh, don't do You're going to be sitting across the table talking very softly, very gently. Right? Because you're building an intimacy. When you want to create intimacy, what do you do? You whisper. Talk softly. We're creating an intimacy with God. We want to create a closeness with God. That's what he wants with us. He wants that closeness. So we have to whisper. You can't scream. And you can't remain silent. Intimacy means whispering. Talk to God. Now it's interesting, by the way. That's why we talk. You know, people ask me this question all the time. You know, God knows what's inside my heart, right? What do I need to tell him? What do I need to talk about it for? You know why we talk? Because when do we talk? You know, you'll notice in life that there's what's called male speech and female speech. What's male speech? Male speech is, did you take the car to the mechanic today? You know, did you, um, you know, you know, I, I went, uh, you know, the tomatoes cost uh, $2.99 a pound. That's male speech. It's very, to the point, concrete, gets things done. And then there's female speech. The men can have female speech, people can have male speech. It's just that this is the prototype. Female speech is you talk because you want, because you want to establish closeness. Women talk, why? Because they want to create closeness. That's why sometimes you'll see this all the time. You'll be walking, it's kind of funny sometimes, right? You'll see walking down the street, you know, a man and a woman, the man's like, oh, she's like, talk, 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 you know, you know, you know isn't that true? No and one time I remember I was sitting, I was, I was walking past a restaurant, and I noticed that you know, a couple were sitting there like at a restaurant, like something outdoors in the city, and he was talk, 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 and she was sitting there. <laughs> and I felt, like, I, I felt like I had to intercede. I felt like I had to do an intervention over here. You know, I just wanted to go over to them and say, stop, enough already. Let her talk. Let her talk. You're killing the night. You're killing the night. She has to talk. You listen. But, you know, I, but I felt it wasn't in my business. That, there I felt it wasn't in my business. But it's interesting. You know, sometimes you even see two women. Two women will walk down the street, right? And they'll both be talking at the same time. You know? <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with it. It's because it, it's creating closeness. Talking creates intimacy. That's why with God, the reason we talk is because, of course God knows what's going on, but the purpose of speech is to create connection, closeness. When you talk with somebody, you get close. That's you get close. And Shem, God, wants us to get close with him. You've got to whisper. You have to talk. Now, what should be going on in ourselves is to create this vision before us. I can't describe it to you, but it's there, and you feel it, and you get a little sense of it. And the more you do it, the more you get a sense of it. That, yeah, God, you're in front of me. You start talking, whispering, thinking. Focus on the Lord. Now, it's interesting that in tefillah, when I mean tefillah right now, I'm speaking about the part of tefillah prayer where we actually come before God and we make requests. You know, we know that tefillah is a ladder. To get this intimacy with God doesn't happen in one moment. Just like creating intimacy with a friend or with a spouse doesn't happen in one moment. It's a process. With God, it's a process also. It's like a ladder that we're climbing. It begins with the section which we call Birchat HaShachar. Birchat HaShachar, we call the morning blessings. If you look at those morning blessings, what are they all about? Thanks. They're all about gratitude. 
all about recognizing how incomplete we would be in life if not for the gifts that God gives us. Now it's interesting, God created us in a way in which we have so many lacks. Now we're the only animal in creation, by the way, that's bothered by its own smell. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> it was worth coming tonight just for that. If you go to CVS, right, pharmacy guys, right? If you go to CVS, what aisle is the largest aisle? Deodorant. Take a look. Cosmetics and deodorants. Deodorants. The largest, you'll find aisles and aisles and aisles of Right Guard and Chur and Old Spice and, you know, It's a huge billion dollar market. Why is it a billion, more multi-billion dollar market? Why? Because we're bothered by the way we smell. Dogs aren't bothered by the way they smell, are they? Horses for sure. <laughs> right? Goats. You don't see it, but we are. We're bothered by it. So I saw once in the Chobot Lubavo, a great rabbi I wrote about a thousand years ago. He says, Hashem made us that way. Why? So we should realize how much we lack, how incomplete we are. We're bothered by even the way we smell. We're so imperfect. Even our own smells upset us. Got a shower. Don't take a shower for a day. How do you feel? I don't take a shower every day, right? <laughs> Twice. You know? You know? No, Can we feel so incomplete? And my kids, my little kids, I got to slap them in the bath. You know, they hate it. But, you know. When you get older, you like it, right? You like it. You know? But we're so, we feel so much, such lack. Now, if you look in the morning, what we're doing in the morning, we're beginning the ladder of intimacy with God. The first way to create that ladder, the first rung on the ladder, is the rung that says, Hashem, I am so incomplete if it's not, if not but for you. And therefore we start thanking God for all the things in life that without which our lives would be totally different. And think about it in the morning. You know, first thing we do, we get up in the morning and what do we thank Hashem for? We thank Hashem, first of all, for the mind, intellect. That's the first blessing you make in the morning. You know, in the olden days, you're supposed to make that blessing actually from the bed. It's a blessing you're supposed to wash your hands, nagel vasa from your bed. Sometimes do people do that? Some people do it today, right? You can walk to the sink if you want to, but if not, some people have their, their water right under the bed. They take it, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And they start making a blessing, Hashem. Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokein HaMelech HaShem, Nasan Nasechli Vim, Nahalav Chim Vim Yom Yom Oh, Hashem, thank you for giving me intellect. The mind works. Blessing number one. What would life be if my mind didn't work the way it worked? Right. We start thanking God for things that without which our lives would be totally, totally different. And appreciate what, how much we lack and how much God takes care of us. Then we start, as we sit up on the bed, we start making blessings over our spinal cord. Isn't it amazing? We make a blessing every morning over our spinal cord. But as we get up, we make a blessing over the ability to stretch. Right? Then we make a blessing over the ability to walk. Amazing blessings. Blessings in which we thank God for the basics of life and we realize how much He gives us. And we try to experience what would life be if I didn't have these things? How I would be lacking and so incomplete. And then we go, we make a very fascinating blessing. We make a blessing over the digestive tract, right? I show you outside, the blessing we say every time we use the, the bathroom. And that blessing is supposed to focus us and realize how miraculous the body is, number one. At the same time, to realize what would life be if it wasn't working this way. And there's a word that we say in the blessing that says, It would be impossible to stand up. And I had a friend who had kidney stones. He had such a severe case of kidney stones, he actually crawled on the floor and could not stand up. And he said to me, I understand those words very well now. When the digestive tract is not working, the urinary system is not working properly, it's impossible to stand. You can't even stand. Now this is the process. First thing in the morning is the beginning of the realization of the fact that we need God so much for our basics. And how God fills our lives with such goodness. Ooh, I'm on the rung now. Now we want to begin climbing. God, this is you. I want to start talking to you. I want to have a relationship with you. And then we start climbing a little deeper, a little higher. We go what we call the Psuke de Zimra. 
Now these are usually psalms, a bunch of psalms over there. Both, if you study them, you know, the truth of the matter, if you don't have time, the only ones you're obligated to say are the Baruch Shamar, Ashrei, and Yishtabach. Okay, three. If you have more time, you say them all. But if you look at them all, they're all talking about, God, wow, you are so wonderful in nature. What you've done for the Jewish people throughout history. We start seeing the depth of God. God, you're not only in my life, but look how wonderful you are in nature. How wonderful you are throughout history. Then we start moving to the next section of davening, the next ladder, in which we start focusing on God as a designer of creation. You're the creator of the sun, creator of the moon. Then we make a very beautiful blessing over God's love for us. Ahava Rabbah, how much you love us. Blessing on God's love for me. And then we put our hands over our eyes and we declare, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is Echad. It's all yours. Everything is you. Nothing in this world is not you. And then we stop and we finish it and we say, Hashem Elokeichem Emet. It's true. It's truth. And then what do we do? We start praising God of being the God. It's all. He's Emet for Yachem. He's everything. He redeemed us from Egypt. Now we step three steps back. Three steps forward. Ah, oh, we're ready to go. And now, what are the first three words we say? The six, first six words we say in that, and the first six words now? Now we're before God. And we say six words. What do we say? Adoshem sifosai tiftach ufi yagid techo. Hashem, open my lips so that my mouth shall declare your praise. God, without you, I can't even open my mouth. You give me the strength to even have speech. To have a mouth that can formulate words and communicate with you is a gift from you. Open my mouth. Allow me to speak. Without you, it's closed. I need help. I'm so dependent. It's all you and I want to talk to you. And speech, by the way, is a function of the soul. Because speech is the most abstract thing we have in the human being. If you think about it, when did speech come, become part of mankind, by the way? So the Torah tells us, when God breathed the soul into Adam, Adam became a speaking being. Nefesh mamala. Ruach mamala, it says. A speaking creature because he came a, within the Shema, he became a speaking creature. Speech is a function of the soul. Because what is speech? Speech is amazing, if you think about it. It's the vibration of air against the vocal cords. And through that vibration, I'm able to express ideas which are very abstract. Yeah. It's an amazing concept, speech. It's a gift of the soul. But God, without you, I wouldn't have that. Hashem, open my mouth now. Give me the strength to open my mouth. It's all you. Without you, I have nothing. And then we begin. Now, here's a problem. The problem is like this. Let's say a person is sick. So they come before God now in our prayers. And by the way, our prayers were written by the men of the Great Assembly. They gave us the formula. These are the great prophets. Follow the text they gave us. The, they gave us the perfect text to say. But there's time in our text also when you could say what you want to say. Either the Shema Kuleinu or at the end. When you say Hashem, when you say at the end. You could, say, you could add your own words. Let's say you're praying now. You finished the text and now I want to speak straight from my heart. You're about to do that. You should do it. And now you want to pray for, let's say, you're sick, God forbid. You're sick. You have a sickness. You have an illness. So God, I want to speak to you now about my illness. God forbid. I, I have an illness. I need your help. God, yeah. I believe in you. I'm here. I'm talking to you. God, now I have to, I, I, want, to, I, I want to get better. So some people might go before God and, and have the following dialogue and say, you know, Hashem, you know, I, you probably haven't realized, but I'm sick. You might not know it, but I'd like to bring it to your attention that I'm in a lot of pain and I have a, a, a disease and you're the source of all cures. Please heal me. What's wrong with that dialogue? What's wrong with that dialogue? You may not know. Yeah, what's wrong with that dialogue? It's from God. He thinks it just happened. Not only God is God, not only does God know, believe me, God knows. He knows about the sickness. 
Not only is God aware of the pain that the person is in, but you know what? God's the cause of the sickness. He's the cause. He gave the sickness. It's from Him. So if I go before God and say, God, you know, by the way, I'd like to make you aware of the fact that I'm sick and I, I need your help to cure me and, and, you know, God would turn back and say, you know, look, I know you're sick. I'm the cause of it. I made you sick. Who do you think did it? It's me, right? You know, when we say these words every day, and listen to what I'm saying. When we say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. When we say God is one, we don't mean that God is one as opposed to two. It's not like there's one God but not two gods. That's not what we're saying. You know what we're saying? God, you're one. There's not one molecule in creation that isn't constantly being controlled and directed by you. Everything is you. When you reach into your pocket and you want three coins and you pull out two, that was Hashem. When you stub your toe at night, it was decreed from above. When a person, God forbid, gets sick, who gave the sickness, God? God's oneness means that he's directing everything. That third dimension we're talking about is all him. We don't experience it that way all the time, but it's all him. So what am I supposed to be doing when I pray? You know about it, God, number one. Right? You could stop it if you wanted to. You're the source of it. And then there's another problem. Now, wait a minute. You're the source of it. And by definition, God, you're all good. And anything you give me, by definition, is for my, my benefit. So maybe I shouldn't ask you to change it. It's like going into surgery, you know. A person sees the, the, the surgeon taking the scalpel, you know, and he's about to remove a cancer. And you say to him, please stop. The surgeon says, I can't stop. I've got to remove the cancer. No, but, but you're causing him pain. What can I do? There's a cancer. By telling God to take away the sickness, aren't we in essence saying, God, I know it's good. I know it's for my benefit. So how can I tell him to stop? He has to do it. I need the sickness for some reason, whatever reason it is. But something I might have done in the past, whatever, whatever it might be, whatever something I need to learn, whatever it might be. So how can I tell God to stop? Do we hear the problem? What's the answer to that? What's the answer? Um, I heard like, um, she was left home. She wasn't pregnant because right. God wanted her to pray. So he wants us to talk to him, he wants us to pray. Oh, interesting. Something very important. What's going on? Yeah, number one, hundred percent. God knows about it. He's the source of it. We don't have to inform him. He's well aware of the illness. He brought it, for example. So what's happening in my tefillah? What's really going on in my prayer? What's really going on when I come before God is a different dialogue. This is the dialogue. The dialogue sounds like this. Hashem, I know this illness is from you. I know you gave it to me because you want me to feel that my life is totally in your hands. That without you, I cannot exist. Without you, I cannot be healthy. As a result of this sickness, I have realized how fragile I am and how much I need you. I've taken the sickness now and I have elevated myself with it. Because of my realization that I'm so dependent on you, Hashem, I become a different person. I'm closer to you. I realize that I need you even more. Oh, you know what happens? Now God can respond. You know why? Because God gave the sickness to the me who wasn't totally, totally aware of him. But now, if through the sickness, I realize that I have to get even closer and closer to him, I've used the sickness to create deeper intimacy, God can say, oh, that was the purpose. I gave you the sickness because I wanted deeper intimacy. I want you to be even closer with me. So I had to create another lack in your life. And through that lack, oh, you used it right. You used that lack to come to me and ask me and get to know me deeper. That was the whole purpose of the sickness. Get better. Here's the cure. Yeah. Oh. Go to the doctor next week. 
look at that, miraculously, the whole CAT scan is different, it's gone, where'd it go? I don't know, maybe it was a mistake on the CAT scan machine, I don't know, I saw it, didn't use it, it's gone, what happened? You hear those stories all the time, don't you? I hear them all the time. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yes. Right. Right. That's a good question. That's a good question. You know, I, it's a very, very interesting question you're asking. You know, but again, you know, even in, in, of course, in mental illness, there are many degrees of mental illness. You know, many degrees. It's, it's not a, you know, it's not you know, health to mental illness. Even in mental illness, there are many areas of awareness. But you might be talking about a situation where a person's mind is gone completely. So they're like, you know, not even aware and can't even go through this process of, of, of even asking God to undo it, perhaps, right? You know, Serge is asking something very important. I always thought about this. You know, I, I've, I'm, in addition to what I do, I do a lot of different things as a rabbi. My main thing, of course, is, is you. I'm in college outreach. I, don't worry. It's my main focus right over here, all of you. But I, I've also been for a number of years, a chaplain in a nursing home. So I did start in my college years, and I stayed with it because I, I, I feel it's meaningful. I always ask myself the following question. This is, I think, with search questions. I ask myself the question, you know, sometimes you go into these nursing homes, and you see people who are literally like vegetables. I mean, I'm sorry to use the word. I don't mean to in any way put anyone, but I'm just using the word so we understand. Right. You see people who had such productive lives, and sometimes you even see pictures on the wall of what they looked like when they were young. And you almost can't believe it, right? You see a guy standing there in a you know, three-piece suit from the 20s or 30s or 40s, you know, and then you look at him now and he's, he's not there. He's a shell of a person. And not only that, you know, when a person gets to that stage, you know, a person can't even eat by themselves, right? You have to feed them. And I'll tell you something. When you feed a little baby and the little baby spits up, what do you do? What do you say? Oh, you say, wasn't that cute? So cute. You know, look, he spit up. Ooh, yeah. Clean up your suit. Cute little. When a 90-year-old man spits up his applesauce over you, what do you say? Boo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nobody says, look how cute it was. You don't say that. You're a little bit disgusted. And you might be a wonderful son or grandson or, or whatever it might be, granddaughter. It doesn't mean, you, at some level, you're disgusted. That's interesting. I always ask myself the question, how come little babies, God created them so cute? You know, and they spit up all over you, it's so beautiful. You know, it's cute, it's funny, it's, it's sweet. An old person also has the same functions of a little baby, on some level. But they spit up all over you and you're disgusted. So I'm just going to share with you, I think, which is a very fascinating point. The greatest gift that God can give us in life is to allow us to have intimacy with them, as we're pointing out. That intimate closeness with them. Old age is the point where a person is going to leave this world. Now, the greatest gift that God can give a person towards the end of their life is the realization that it's only about me and you. That's it. Your children, who you thought you could rely on, they're disgusted by you. Your body, which you thought was you, it's not you. Your money doesn't mean anything. You're almost trapped inside of your mind. And the mind is still there on the inside. They might not have to express on the outside. But there's a lot going on on the inside. What's a person doing on the inside? Creating that connection with God. Creating an intimacy. And the greatest gift you can give someone before they leave this world is to give them God to tell them, look, don't make any mistakes anymore. That third dimension that you might have ignored during your life or never really spent time to, 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 um, to nourish, that connection with me, now I'm giving you the opportunity because everything else is gone. It's just you and me. That's what's happening. I dare say a person that's so mentally ill they can't speak to God. What's going on inside their minds, what we can't see, yeah. There's an intimacy being created with God, a realization that God, it's all about you and me. That's all. Me and you. You know what the most profound moment of life is? What's the most important moment of life? The moment just before you die. You know why? 
Because that moment just before you die, you have the total realization that God, it is about me and you and nothing else. Everything else was a lie, was an illusion, not a lie, an illusion. You know, I thought my money was important. I thought my career was important. I thought my clothing was important. I thought it was so important to drive a fancy car. Oh. Am I right? This isn't a Jewish concept. This is a, this is a, this is a human concept. That moment before death means you've got to give it back to God. It's about me and you. God, I just want an intimacy with you because that's reality. That's all there is. It's that third dimension I can't see, and now here it is. And that's why, by the way, in Judaism, we have a death penalty. Now, we, it's very hard to enforce. Nobody panic. In fact, it hasn't been enforced in thousands of years in very few cases throughout Jewish history. But there is such a concept. And the reason is that there's such a concept is because sometimes the only way to achieve atonement is the death process. Because that point just before death, what does the person do? Shuva. God, it's you. Nothing else. I just want to be with you, and I'm sorry. See how it works? And that's what our rabbis tell us. When God really loves you, what does he do? He causes you, not punishes. He causes pain in your life. When he loves you, it's called Yisurim Ahava. I call it Yisurim, pain to create connection. In other words, when you feel everything's going well in life, you know, my stomach is full, my gas tank is full, my bank account is full, right? You know, everything I want is going well. What do I need God for? You know what God says? I desire intimacy with you so much. And you desire intimacy with me so much. And the only way we can create it sometimes in life is to cause a lack. And through that lack, through that pain, through the financial loss, through that emotional pain, whatever it might be, I have to come to Hashem and say, Hashem, I know this is from you. But now I'm using it as a means to get closer to you. Please change it. Shem can say, oh, that's exactly what I was looking for. I was using it as an opportunity for you to gain that intimacy with me, and you used it correctly. Now I can remove the pain, the financial loss, the emotional pain. That's how it works. That's why it says God loves those to whom he afflicts. Sometimes when God causes pain in life, it can be for many reasons. It could be for the reason that, it could be for something we did in a past life, even, you know. It could be for something I did in my life, and the only way to undo it is through a degree of pain to help me realize the mistake that I made and repent on it. Or sometimes it might have nothing to do, anything to do with past life or anything I did in this life. It's be merely because God loves me so much that He wants me to get even closer to Him. He flicks those He loves. So a lady said to me the other night, she said, God, don't love me so much. <laughs> Enough of the love already. <laughs> but you know, it's not true, because that connection, that intimacy that we create with God through the lack that we experience is what we cherish and take for eternity. Because it's that connection that we create with God in this world will be the connection that we're going to actually have forever. So God's doing us the greatest gift by allowing us to create intimacy in this world with Him. And there's nothing greater than it. You can have an intimacy with God, a closeness to God. And our lives in this world are so much different. And you could be a Chayasar Kramer, you know? You could be an Auschwitz. An Auschwitz. And say, compared to an ashram, it wasn't a bad place. Because we used it to gain an intimacy with God. We lived in that third dimension, that intimacy. If you're living in that intimacy, it's a good place. You can find goodness in everything in life. And that's what the feel is doing. The feel is taking us on that ladder. Gratitude, praise, God's love, God's oneness, His truth. And now, an opportunity to come before Him in an intimate discussion and dialogue. That's the beauty of it. And it's so essential and so important and so powerful. And when you do it right, you feel so good. You feel so good. And we have to remember that every time we ask God for something, even if we don't see the direct result from it, by the way, all prayers are heard and all prayers are answered. And our sages teach us, you know how they're answered sometimes? Sometimes they're answered even for the next generation. Did you know the fact that all of us that are sitting here today, listening to this lecture, and we're trying to come closer to the Almighty, to our Creator, 
and we know that we're Jews and we're proud to be Jews and we realize the beauty of Torah, the beauty of mitzvot, and we want to get on this path and live our lives with this dedication. You know what, by, and what, whereas there are 14, 12, you know, 12, 14 million Jews in the world, you know, I would say about 11 million of them have never even heard of this type of discussion. And here you're part of this elite group that merits to even be in the game. You know why that could be? It could be because of the prayer of your grandparents. Prayers of your grandparents that maybe didn't get responded to them in their lives, but get saved up for their grandchildren. We have the merit of our grandparents, their prayers. Or, our rabbis tell us, when things go well in life, when things go smoothly in life, Baruch Hashem, what a good day today, you know? The car just missed me, you know? Right? You know, I got to, you know, the facts came on time. What, you know, everything went well. I arrived at my point without traffic. You know, things go well. My kids are doing well, Baruch Hashem, you know, ooh, I had something to eat. Everything's going well. When things go well in life, you know what it is? That's God taking those prayers that he might not have used for the situation we asked him for, because maybe he felt that we needed that pain still for whatever reason. But he said, but believe me, I heard it. I would have used those prayers over here. When things go well, our prayers are being answered. Things don't have to go well. When they go well in life, it's because God is using those prayers. They're always answered, they're always heard. That's why prayer, tefillah, it's a mitzvah like no other mitzvah. It's not that we pray like we have 613 mitzvahs and prayer happens to be one of them. It is one of them. But it happens to be the crown jewel of them all. Because if the purpose of Torah, the purpose of mitzvot, is to gain connection to God, to have intimacy with God. In fact, the word mitzvah in Hebrew is from the Hebrew word sav, which means connection. We have 613 points of connection. If that's the goal of mitzvot, to connect us with 613 points. Prayer, tefillah, it's the way in which that intimacy is actually concluded. It's the highest point of intimacy. It's a dialogue. It's a discussion. It's a speech. That's what prayer is all about. So my friends, I tell you, you know, don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big God is. Speak to God. Talk to God. Develop that intimacy. It's the greatest pleasure we can have in life. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. We have some delicious kugel waiting for us over here. Yes. Oh, excuse me.